In Search of Ireland's Ancient Astronomers Presented by Anthony Murphy In this lecture, Anthony Murphy describes the evidence that the people who inhabited Ireland over 5,000 years ago were advanced astronomers and adept surveyors and that significant astronomical data survives today in the stories, myths and folklore recorded live at Megalithomania Conference 2007. Delighted to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And um, myself and Richard are very interested in Glastonbury. This is the first time we've been here. Glastonbury is actually mentioned in Chapter 12 of the book because there are some very interesting connections between Ireland and Glastonbury uh, relating to St. Patrick. And um, it's an area that we hope to be exploring in the future. Um, Ireland uh, is very similar to Britain in many ways in terms of its megalithic heritage. We have megalithic monuments that are scattered right across the landscape. Uh, this is Newgrange. Uh, Newgrange is the primary example of the Irish passage tomb, what archaeologists call passage tombs. There are estimated to be about 1,400 of these in Ireland scattered across the land. This is the most fam famous example. It's one of the biggest. It's also the most illustrious in terms of its myth mythical and historical past. Now, it's another example of how Irish, the Irish government treats heritage because the only time the Irish government seems to care about heritage in Ireland is when they're able to make some money out of it. And what you see here at Newgrange is this, this uh, white facade is supported by an 18-foot concrete wall. So there has been a certain amount of reconstruction at Newgrange. So some of the energy of the site, if th those of you that go to these places that feel energy, some of the energy of Newgrange has been lessened over the last few decades. Uh, this is a, a wee map of the Boyne Valley, uh, which is on our website. Uh, the red mounds being the main mounds, the central one here is, uh, this is Newgrange, this is Douth, and this is Nouth. And there's a total of about 50 or so monuments in the bend of the Boyne. You can see this is the river here. It loops, it loops all the way around the sites. There are about 50 sites contained within the bend of the Boyne, many of which are very ancient and most of which, thankfully, haven't been excavated or reconstructed. Uh, passage tombs occur in three major groups in Ireland, one in Brunabonia, the, the Boyne Valley, another not so far away in Loch Crew in County Meath, and then there are the uh, cemeteries of Carrowmoor and Carrow Keel in Sligo. Of course, there are scattered examples all over the place, but these are the main concentrations. Now, conventional archaeology and the establishment in Ireland is reticent about the whole subject of astronomy. Uh, to the extent that there's, they've been in denial for a long time, which is great for people like me and Richard because we're able to sneak in under the radar and show them that perhaps there's a little bit more to it. Some of the imagery that you see on the stones, and bear in mind that these carvings in many cases are five, five and a half, maybe 6,000 years old. Uh, to me, they're explicitly astronomical. They relate to the stars, the sun, the moon. You see, you see st stellar symbols, you see suns, you see moons. See all that sort of stuff going on. So that's just like a prelude to the talk, which is basically a quick run through what's in the book. But um, don't be discouraged from buying the book at the end. This is Bal Trey. Uh, until 1999, a completely unknown site. A, a twin, a pair of standing stones overlooking the Boyne Estuary. Apparently, the people who live in Bal Trey, half of them didn't even know these standing stones existed. Until... My friend, the artist, and my co-author, Richard Moore, uh, took me along one, there, one, one day and, and showed me this site. And while we were there, we took some measurements off the main stone, which looks like a hand. It's like a hand. It's got a, a broad axis from one side and a narrow from the other. And our friend, another astronomer, Michael Byrne, discovered when he put his binoculars along the side of the stone that he could see an island out to sea called Rockabill. So I postulated, based on our measurements, that it was a winter solstice alignment. And in fact, in December of that year, Richard and Michael observed that directly and videotaped it. So what we had actually discovered was this uh, apparently simple monument uh, at the estuary of the Boyne, you know, the most illustrious river in Ireland and only six or seven miles upstream where Brunabonia is, and uh, that it had an astronomical alignment and it actually shares the same alignment as Newgrange because it's winter solstice sunrise. Um, a lot of the time, unfortunately, low cloud blocks the actual moment of sunrise. Uh, somebody was talking about the weather yesterday. This is a more recent shot. Uh, this is the island. Sorry, sorry. Whoops. Technology, eh? This is Rockabill. It has a lighthouse on it today. 
Now, there are actually two islands. The smaller island cannot be seen in this picture because of a, a, a miraging effect. The sun is now, uh, roughly speaking, two or so sun widths to the left of where it was. At the time, these standing stones were erected, and we suspect that that was the Neolithic. Uh, Irish archaeologists say uh, they usually pinpoint the date of erection of standing stones to the Bronze Age, because oftentimes there are burials found close to uh, standing stones, but we actually believe they, they go all the, all the way back, especially in the case of uh, Baltray. And this is just a quick idea of the alignments. If you align the, the, the large stones, they point to Fornox, which is another passage tomb that we'll be talking about later. And if you look along the axis of the big stone, you've got the winter solstice alignment to Rockabill, and in the other direction you have uh, standing stones at place, places called Carnanbrega and Barnavadog. That's Barn of a Dog there. It's the largest standing stone in County Louth. It's massive. It's uh, two and a half, three meters high. Huge, big thing. I don't know if anybody was looking at the sky last night. Fantastic sight. The crescent moon and Venus together. Now, this wasn't taken last night, obviously, but we went up to the Wirral Hill last night to the Holy Thorn, and we watched it up there. Um, Gail had her telescope with her. Thanks a million, Gail. That was a great, great experience. And the reason I'm bringing the moon and Venus into it at this early stage is because in Irish myth, we think there are very strong references to the moon and Venus. And the ultimate astronomical decipherment of all the sites in the Boyne and further afield in Ireland relies on looking at the moon and the planets, the sun, of course, and the Milky Way and the stars, ultimately. Moon and Venus are very important. At, at Baltray, there's a legend that speaks about Balor, who is very much a, a Fomorian sun deity, like an Irish cyclops, who, who carries the magic cow under her calf, or he leads them down the coast, and they stop at the Boyne. We think that this is a story that relates to, Bal or to, to Baltray. And uh, the moon being the cow, and Venus being the calf. This is uh, a picture of the Boyne estuary looking back towards Drogheda. Uh, this was uh, a few years ago. There was a bit of an aurora borealis, so I... Nipped out, nipped out in the car in the middle of the night to try and get some pictures. And uh, as you can see, the old bane of astronomy, this light pollution, comes in. But uh, the reason I'm showing you this picture is just here on the left bank of the Boyne, according to MIT, this is the landing point of some very illustrious people in Ireland. One was uh, Amergan, who led the Milesian invasion from Spain in and around the year 1694 BC, according to the annals. And later, that exact spot was where St. Patrick was said to have landed, interestingly enough. And the reason Amergan comes into the whole thing is because Amergan made this chant. And it, clearly he is an astronomer because he says things like, who but I knows the place where the sun sets? Who but I knows the ages of the moon? What land is better than this island of the setting sun, which is, of course, where the book gets its title from? Uh, this is another shot of the aurora down at the uh, Boyne Estuary at the Maiden Tower. And there's another monument beside the Maiden Tower called the Lady's Finger, which doesn't at all resemble a finger. It's a very phallic stone of unknown origin. And um, the two, the tower and the stone, line up uh, for mariners. If you line them up when you're coming out to in, in from the sea, it gives you the correct path to enter the Boyne. Yes, Amergan. This guy is going to feature very strongly today. Amergan was one of eight brothers who came from Spain but originally from Egypt. The Milesians were, had their origin in, in Egypt, and uh, they came to conquer Ireland to take it from the Tuatha de Danann. And Amergan came with his brothers, and he was the first one to set foot on the Boyne. And uh, for that reason, he seems to have been the leader of the pack, although it was his brother Aramon that later assumed the kingship. This is Millmount in Drogheda. Now, Millmount, up until the year 1808, Millmount was just a mound. It was a, a, what, what we call in Ireland a moat. And I don't know if if you classify your monuments here the same way we do, a moat is a, is a mound which has apparently been artificially created and it usually has a flat top and it's usually attributed to the Normans. The Normans apparently came in and built these things all over Ireland as defensive structures. This was apparently built in 1100 AD. Nonsense. It's been there since the Neolithic. Under there is a, a Stone Age passage tomb which in local folklore is said to be one of the mounds of Brunabonia. And historical documents relate that it, it, it contains in its underbelly uh, subterraneous passageways, which would suggest that these are not accessible today because some nice people um, from your country 
uh, who, who had uh, come over to our country decided to turn Drogheda into a garrison town. And what happened was they fortified Millmount in the year 1808. So they built a wall around the bottom and they fortified the top. And unfortunately, it's been that way ever since. So there's no archaeology that will prove this one way or the other. But we think there are some other things that can help. One is the fact that on the equinox, looking west towards Slane, the sun sets on the hill of Slane. Now, that's the peak of the hill of Slane there. Now, Slane is very famous in, in the, you know, the mythical history of Ireland as well as the historical history of Ireland as being the place where St. Patrick lit the first Paschal fire at Easter time, bringing the message and the flame of Christianity to Ireland in defiance of the King of Tara. We'll talk a little bit about that in a while. But, you know, when you go to Slane, and this is the most amazing thing, you go to Slane and you come up the hill and there are these ruins. You see the tower, the church tower, the graveyard, and what's called the college, which was, you know, the seat of great learning in the past. But behind all of that, fenced off in the trees, where beyond notice, basically, there's a big mound. Another of these Norman moats, which is said in mythology to be the burial place of a great fur bulg leader known as Slánia, and that's where Slane gets its name, from King Slánia, and he's said to be buried up there. So we have one of these, I don't know, you call it a ley line, that's what we'd call it, an alignment involving two sites which are apparently ancient, uh, pointing towards an astronomical event. And of course, don't forget, this is a picture uh, of exactly the same thing, looking across at Slane from Millmount, around the time of a couple of days from the equinox. And uh, yeah, the curious thing about all this is that um, we don't actually know whether Patrick really existed, to be honest. You know, looking at, the, looking at all the, the, the stuff that we've seen in Ireland, we've kind of come to the conclusion much of what surrounds Patrick is myth. You know, it's presented as a historical, they're presented as historical events. But the fact of the matter is, in Ireland, in every parish in the country, there's something named after him. He's supposed to have visited every parish in the country long before the motor car was invented. I mean, I don't know if he had some sort of secret flying device or if he had a time machine or something. He was a fairly mir miraculous being. This is summer solstice sunset from Millmount, which occurs in the direction of the Hill of Rats, looking towards the Black Hill in Cullen. And Black is a, a name place in Ireland containing black usually relates to the sun, the darkening of the year or the brightening of the year. And then winter solstice. Now, this is what you see in winter solstice because, you know, we've got all this stuff going on in the foreground. Obviously, Drogheda is an expanding town, 35,000 people and growing all the time. You've got this hideous cement factory in the view. But if you were able to, let's say, get into a hot air balloon and hover a little bit above Millmount, what you would actually see is Tara. The sun sets over the hill of Tara from Millmount on the winter solstice. There's some very interesting alignments going on at Millmount. So, aside from the fact that people are talking about underground passages, it seems to have some alignments which would suggest that it's ancient. And it was indeed a folklorist who's now deceased, uh, Helen Bani Harbour in Drogheda. And uh, she uh, was the first one to tell myself and Richard over a drink. She ran a pub in Drogheda, a traditional Irish pub. And she was the first one to tell us, Millmount is one of the mounds of Brunabonia. That is folklore fact. If folklore can be taken to be fact. Uh, this intrigued us because Millmount is on the south side of the Boyne and it's out of the bend of the Boyne. It's not one of those 50 monuments that I was talking to you a while ago. And of course then we go to Tara, which is on the winter solstice alignment. And uh, one and a half kilometers north of this scene, the motorway is currently being built. And just to the east of Tara, they're currently They've discovered a site call, uh, at a place called Lis Mullen, and the site is a henge, it's a wood henge. And these things are very rare in Ireland. Now, all it is, of course, is circles of post holes in the ground. But nonetheless, it's such a unique monument that one would imagine that, you know, that will lead to the automatic halting of the road and the preservation of the site, because this is such a unique site. I don't think that's going to happen, because the minister in Ireland who controls roads is the same minister that controls heritage. And he has the power under Irish law, with one stroke of his pen, to have that monument scraped out of existence. And on, on, that's very, very unfortunate in my view. And I'm delighted that I'm able to take this message to England and plant a seed maybe here today and get some other people involved in trying to stop this lunacy. Because very close to 
uh, Lismullen is another fantastic site. It's called a promontory fort. It's built on an esker. It's, it's called Rath Lou, and Lou is a very famous guy. We're going to talk about him later. And uh, it's forested. It's been protected by the trees for centuries. But they're going to chop the side of it off for the road, uh, but not before some of us are lying down in front of the bulldozers, I can assure you. But uh, Ratloo is going to be very exciting. Myself and Richard looked at the maps in the last couple of weeks, and we found that Ratloo actually sits on another alignment. Uh, so there's some, some, some additional stuff going on there. This m mound here, it's a tiny little uh, Neolithic passage tomb on the top of the hill of Tara, is called the Mound of the Hostages, Dumman and Gil. Now, the curious thing about Tara is that we know there's been settlement there and activity there since the Neolithic, but the problem is, is when you go up there, you don't really get to see much of it because that's basically all that's left. That's the only visible sign that there was activity here in the Stone Age. And Tara is so, I don't know, prolific in, in, in the history of Ireland. It's such an important place. It beggars belief that something that's on the scale of Newgrange isn't up there. But that's just the way it is. And more discoveries have been made all the time. This is a discovery that was made about five or six years ago uh, using ground penetrating radar of a giant underground, you know, just under the surface henge or uh, ritual enclosure. This is an old map of Tara showing the various uh, monuments. The reason I wanted to show you this was because beside the Mount of the Hostages, uh, and this was drawn in and around the 1830s, I think, 1840s, uh, as part of the Ordnance Survey of Ireland. There's another mound beside the, the Dumman and Gael called Sheer Dove on the Mo, the Western Mound of the Cow. And this is, I want to talk about the cow and calf a bit today. And curiously, on Tara, too, there's a well on either side of the hill, and one of them's called the Cow Well, and another is called the Calf. This is another well completely. This is the Trinity Well in Carberry in Kil County Kildare. And the reason this comes into things is this is said to be Necton's Well, which is the mythical rising place of the Boyne River. And the story goes that Necton owned this well. He was the king, and he had his three cup bearers, and nobody was to go near it. it was, access to the well was forbidden. But uh, his wife, Boan, decided she was going to go to the well, and she went round the well three times the wrong way, and the well burst out and basically rushed down towards the sea and formed the Boyne and brought her out to sea and drowned her. And curiously enough, her, she was drowned at sea and her dog was formed into the Rockabill Islands. And the reason we think that's important is because while the, in the Neolithic, the sun would have been rising over Rockabill from Baltray, so too would Sirius. It just so happens that at the time Newgrange was being built in the Neolithic, that Sirius shared the same rising place as Winter Solstice Sun. But this is on the alignment from here. Sorry, keep pressing the wrong button. From here, through Tara to Millmount, this is on one ley line. So what you have is, if the source of the Boyne, you have a mound overlooking the estuary, and roughly halfway between you have the Hill of Tara, the ancient seat of the kings in Ireland. Also, another curious thing that happens in the Neolithic document in the book is the fact that Orion actually sets over Tara, and in actual fact, it's specifically the Orion Nebula. The Fall is a very interesting stone. Uh, so Curious stories surrounding it, and there's some belief that it's supposed to be Jacob's pillow, and I think the British Israelites are very excited about Tara, and they think the Ark of the Covenant is buried down there. Uh, but the Leofall is a very phallic stone, and in fact, it's been known as the penis stone. And what happens here is that Orion's uh, little package appears to set over. So I don't know whether there's some symbolism there, but the interesting thing about Orion is, and we'll talk about this later as well, is that Orion is actually the Sky King. He represents some of the mythical characters we come across in Irish myth are ostensibly mythical Orions, uh, Nuadu being one of them. He was known as Nuadu of the Silver Arm, and Orion's raised arm lies in the path of the Silvery Milky Way, which runs past here. And the legend goes that Necton, or uh, Necton Nuadu, sorry, I should have explained, there are two names for the same uh, personage, uh, had his arm chopped off in the Battle of Moitura, and uh, his healer, Dian Kecht, made him a new one from silver. <laughs> That's the way the legend goes. Uh, inspiring later uh, Star Wars, because apparently the scene, uh, Joseph Campbell, the comparative uh, mythologist, he worked very closely with George Lucas. And apparently the scene where Luke Skywalker confronts Darth Vader in Star Wars is uh, inspired by this myth. And you know that Luke's uh, father chops his arm off, and then Luke goes back to the spaceship and has a new 
robotic silver arm attached. Well, that's apparently all inspired by this myth. So we can think of Tara as being the seat of the Sky King as much as the High King. There's a beautiful picture of the Orion Nebula, which may be, we think, we've connected it with the Necton as well, that the idea that this mysterious milky patch of light in Orion may be the source of the, um, the heavenly Milky Way. Here is a giant henge in the Boyne Valley known uh, very glamorously as Site Q. Uh, they've given all the sites letters. This is Site Q. It's one of the largest surviving ringed structures in Ireland. It's massive. It's an egg-shaped structure with a large opening here at the southwest and a smaller opening here at the northeast. There's a long-running argument going on here. Myself and Richard, in the year 2000, we kind of speculated that if you line up the two gaps that there's a solstice alignment. And we went there and we witnessed it and we photographed it. Here's a photograph from that year. We got up at 4 o'clock in the morning to see this. The sunrise just at around 5 o'clock. So we're outside the uh, structure looking towards the sunrise. So we suggested that it's a solstice site. And then the archaeologist said, well, hang on a second, because that far gap, that northeastern gap up there, looks like it's been messed around. And in fact, some archaeologists believe that it's not contemporary with the site, which led us to great difficulty with the theory. So in other words, that this gap had been at some stage opened for maybe, you know, access for farm machinery or whatever, because this... Uh, area has been under extensive tillage for the last couple of centuries. So we, uh, we actually abandoned, well not exactly abandoned, but we let that idea slip. And in one of the most extraordinary coincidences, because we had so many extraordinary coincidences in the eight years of the project, that five years to the day after that, at summer solstice, we were at Millmount and we met none other than Professor Ronald Hicks of Ball State University. University, who is a world henge expert and who had written in 1985 that this site was solsticially aligned. And I said to him, but Ron, what's the story with the northeastern gap? And he said, well, it certainly has been messed around, but he, his belief is that it's contemporary with the original structure, which was great news for us. This is an aerial picture of the remnants of a site. I, have to t I had to include this. This is in the book. This is a site which has been deemed to be Ireland's Stonehenge. It's gone, wiped off the face of the earth, unfortunately. All that remains is a little crop mark. This site, if it existed today, I've written this and I stand over it, if this site existed today, it would not only rival Newgrange as being Ireland's premier monument, it would actually rival your Stonehenge because it was bigger. And the fantastic thing about it was is that from the drawing, the only drawing that we have, I'm out of sequence there. I need to go back to that one in a second. The only drawing that we have, it's clear that they were unhewn stones. They weren't crafted or shaped in any way. And what it actually was, was a triple ring structure. So you had two rings of standing stones in the center, a giant bank, and outside this, what can only be described as enormous monoliths. Now, this structure, this, I'm, I think if I have my figures right, this bank is 80 meters in diameter, larger than the outer bank at Stonehenge. So that gives you an idea of the sort of scale of the site. It was rediscovered in an aerial photograph by another ar archaeologist from Drogheda called Victor Buckley in 1988. He had been looking through some of the Cambridge archive of aerial photographs, and he saw this, and he got very excited about it. Uh, this drawing was done in 1749 uh, by a man called Thomas Wright, who was a draftsman and an astronomer, and uh, one of these people that was interested in all this stuff. And he documented all of County Loud's ancient sites, and this is one. He gave a very brief description of it, but his drawing, he was very good at drawing, so we can take it that this is a very accurate representation of what he found. Today, sadly, all that remains of it is a footprint, literally just a little bit of archaeology under the ground, and in January of 2006, because this area is now under development from housing and other things, um, there was some archaeology done here, and you know, the footprint of this massive uh, Stonehenge became visible. So that's Ireland's Stonehenge, which, according to one historian writing in the early part of the 20th century, was said to have been an ancient school of astronomy. But that's all he says, and he says no more, and I can't find any more, <laughs> unfortunately, as to where he got that from, what source, who said it to him, where did they get it from. But the interesting thing about the Stonehenge is that when you're standing there, there's a sweep of mountains from the north all the way over to the east. 
And he suggests, this guy, uh, Henry Morris, writing for the Louth Archaeological Journal, he suggests that they use the mountains to mark the rising positions of certain stars and sun and moon, which is precisely, as we know from studying other sites, exactly what they do. I mean, we saw yesterday the Sleeping Beauty, the moon rising out of the hag's belly at Callanish. Fantastic, which is something that resonates all over the place it's in Ireland too. This is another picture of Site Q, uh, the darkening coming over Site Q as a reason for that because we're moving on to dark things. But I suppose that would give you some idea of the uh, scale of Ireland Stonehenge if it was there today. If you could imagine a giant embanked structure with huge monoliths around it. And unfortunately, that's all you can do is to imagine it. So with darkening in mind, we move on to Douth. And Douth is a sister site of Newgrange. Uh, the only one that hasn't been excavated in modern times, there was a botched job archaeology done on it in the 1840s. Uh, some um, antiquarians came along, the treasure hunting type, and basically dug a big trench in the middle of it and then started using dynamite to blow some of the stones away. So it has been badly damaged, but it still retains much of its kind of ancient feeling. Originally, it was a lot taller than this. In the drawings from before the archaeology, it, it almost looks like a... It reminds me of the Tor, actually, in some ways, the way it rises up. And there's uh, some very stark symbolism etched onto the stones here. This is a very famous stone that Martin Brennan, the author and pioneer in this field of uh, megalithic ast astronomical research in Ireland, he, he identified this and he called this stone the Stone of the Seven Suns because there are in total seven sun symbols on, on the stone. Were they astronomers? Well, perhaps... The legend of Douth is very interesting because it ties in with astronomy, it ties in with what the site does, and it also tells us a little bit about the name. I'll give you the legend very quickly. The legend says that the King of Ireland, who was Bressel, brought all the men of the country together in this place to build him a tower from which he could pass to heaven. It sounds a bit like the Nimrod tower legend. So all the men came along, and the king said, look, I promise you there's going to be everlasting day for this task. It's going to be continuous days so we can get this done. So they set about making the hill. And what happened was the king went off and committed incest with his sister. Uh, because a magical spell had been cast by the sister to, to make the sun stand still. And as we all know, all our megalithomaniacs, standing still sun equals solstice. And the reason this picture is on the screen is because at the time of the solstice in Ireland... And, the, and it's, it's more accented the further north you go, but at the latitude of Douth, this picture was taken at half past 12 midnight on midsummer last year. Myself and Richard walked around Douth in the middle of the night with, without, the age of, without the aid of torches. It doesn't quite do the scene justice because you can quite clearly see everything. You can see where you're walking and everything. Uh, but it nicely illustrates the fact that if you wanted to build something and you wanted eternal light for it, you would have it at this time of year. Because at this time of year, from now onwards, for a month either side of summer solstice in Ireland, there's no such thing as dark night. You have this constant glow on the horizon. So what happened? They committed incest. Male and female came together. Sudden darkness descended upon the place. And the men of Ireland said, oh, he's after promise promising us light for this job. And because darkness has come, let's abandon the task. And they abandoned the task. And the legend says that forevermore shall it be known as Dovud, which is the Irish for darkness. And of course, the anglicized Dovud is Douth. Here's a picture of the total eclipse of August 1999. This is as much as we saw in Drogheda. I believe some people in Cornwall were lucky enough to see the total eclipse. This is what we think. This, we think that this explains nicely the myth of the male, union of male and female. In the Irish mythical scene, the sun is always male, and the moon is always female. Now that differs from country to country, and in fact in some countries it swaps, but in Ireland that's what we see, we see male and female. The coming together of male and female bringing a sudden darkness, to me that's a total eclipse at the time of the summer solstice, that's what the legend seems to be about. This is the southern of two passages at Douth. Now they're both on the western side, but because one is more southerly than the other, they're called Douth South and Douth North, but that's kind of confusing because it doesn't point north at all, the northern. But anyway, this is a southern passage which accepts sunlight on the winter solstice, a discovery made by Martin Brennan and his team in 1980, hadn't been witnessed previously, and in more recent times studied in detail by the author Anna Marie Moroni in her booklet, Douth winter sunsets and this is a picture from her booklet uh, if you're if the, unfortunately the northern of the two passages is blocked up it's blocked up with this concrete shaft that was put in in the early 1900s by the OPW to allow people in and out of the Neolithic structure but unfortunately 
they completely stopped up uh, any possibility of light getting in there. But if light was able to get in there and you're able to stand in the back, you'd be looking over at Newgrange for the Samhain in bulk sunset. Okay? So just bear that in mind. So we're going to progress this a little bit. Uh, don't know why that... Are we moving on? Oh, sorry. Okay, because I need to tell you just one more thing about Douth. And that's the fact that as well as accepting winter solstice, sun, and uh, uh, November, February, sun, the passages are also oriented such that the southern passage accepts major standstill moonset and the northern passage accepts minor standstill moonset. And in fact, our study has shown, and this is all in the book, 20 pounds downstairs, and I will sign copies later. Um, <coughs> yeah, they're actually more precisely aligned on the moon than they are on the sunsets, curiously enough. And the reason this is interesting in terms of doubt is because that brings you to what we call the moon swing. And anybody that's familiar with Alexander Thom's work will know that if you're studying the moon swing, you're probably looking at eclipses. <laughs> the two things go hand in hand. Well, not necessarily. You don't need the moon swing for eclipses to happen. But the fact of the matter is, if you observe one, you will see the other. The two things kind of go hand in hand. That's, what, that's basically what Tom says. So bizarrely, we have this legend about doubt, speaking about darkness and eclipses, and the passages seem to point to the lunar standstills, which, if you were studying them diligently, would eventually lead you to see the pattern that there is with eclipses. And if you go back to the seven sunstone, you know, and maybe I will go back, the seven sunstone, we've mentioned this, one interpretation, there it is, one interpretation is that these are uh, eclipse drawings. I don't know if anybody's ever seen photographs of a total eclipse. But you see, you have this dark area, and then you have the, the rays. It's like the, um, the sun's corona coming out behind. Uh, some people have suggested that, and that's, uh, that works for me, to be honest, as an interpretation of those drawings. The other curious thing about doubt, just before we head to Newgrange, is that uh, it has apparently 115 curbstones, not all visible. That's a, a guessed amount. That's half the number of synodic lunar months in one moon swing cycle. So if doubt is about eclipses, and if it is about studying the moon swing, then there's one curbstone, well, one curbstone for, for each synodic month, but you multiply it by two. Newgrange, the most famous of them all, uh, needs no introduction. Winter solstice alignment, um, the sun comes in there just after 9 a.m. on winter solstice and shines into the interior of the chamber for about 14 minutes. Originally, due to the effects of uh, precession and the obliquity of the eclip ecliptic, the sun is slightly off position as we saw at Baltray. It's two sun widths to the left of where it used to be. Apparently, originally, the sunbeam went all the way into the back of the chamber and would have, by reflection, lit up this tri-spiral symbol on the stone there, which is quite nice. And this is a picture of the actual moment when the sun comes in and illuminates the floor. Just a little note for you. If you plan to go to the Boyne Valley for the winter solstice, you have a hope in hell of getting into Newgrange because currently there's a, a lottery because the, the waiting list became so long. And currently, the odds last year, I think we worked them out, the odds of getting in, of winning the lottery, are 580 to 1. But the curious thing is you go to Douth that evening and you actually freely access the chambers, providing the group isn't too big. And we saw the sun coming into Douth South last year and there was like 200 people at Newgrange, none of whom got to see this because there's only a few VIPs allowed into Newgrange on the morning and a couple of um, lottery winners. Swans. Here's some of the, uh, the local swan population. Some of these are mute swans, which are there all year round, and some are whooper swans, which migrate here every year from uh, uh, Iceland. And uh, Andy Collins is very interested in all this, and this is why he became interested in our work, because we actually found that there's an intense connection between swans and Newgrange, uh, not least for the fact that they actually come there every year in large numbers. In fact, so large numbers that this has been designated a very important wintering ground for whooper swans in Ireland. We're, we're kind of suggesting that they've been coming since ancient times, basically. Uh, the, the reason the swans are all so interesting is because Newgrange has a cruciform, a cru cross-shaped design, its passage and chamber. So if you think of, you know, the cross, that's the shape that the swan constellation has in the sky, Cygnus. It's quite neat, fits quite neatly. Another little thing that 
cropped up in our investigation over the eight years was the fact that if you extend the line out from Newgrange, in other words, look at where Newgrange points to, if you could kind of fly, magically fly out the roof box of Newgrange into the distance, eventually you would hit this little passage tomb that we mentioned earlier called Fornox. Fornox is a tiny little passage tomb. It's, only, it's less than 15 meters in diameter. It's been reconstructed a little bit. There's a, a, a concrete dome on it, but it's a nice little place. I like it. I get a good vibe up there. And Fornox has a, a strange alignment. Well, we thought it strange initially because it points too far north to accept any sunrise or moonrise. It's too far to the north. So we wondered what was going on there. And we went to the computer software and we tried to recreate the sky as it was around the year 3000 BC from that latitude. And what we found was Deneb, the bright star of Cygnus, was rising off the horizon in just the place where this passage pointed to. We wondered, was there any significance to that? And indeed, there was a processional significance because we opened up a whole new can of worms. Not only were we saying, see, in Ireland at the moment, conventional wisdom says that they were solar astronomers. They were not lunar astronomers. They were not stellar astronomers. It's nonsense to say that somebody is a solar astronomer. It's like having a clock with no hands and no numbers. It, that's basically what a solar astronomer is. And on that basis, if you wanted to build a new grange, you would have to go out there every winter solstice for years to get your structure right. But if you were a proper astronomer, and if you had been just looking at what goes on in the sky, you could go out there every night for a couple of weeks and construct the same alignment looking at the stars. Because you would know, being a competent astronomer, what stars rise in the place that the sun at winter solstice rises. So it's nonsense. And, uh, but anyway, despite that, we're plowing our own furrow on this one. We're telling the establishment, don't talk nonsense. Just because the moon is too complicated for you to understand doesn't mean it was too complicated for them. After all, they didn't live indoors watching telly all night. But interestingly, from the point of view of procession, so we were saying that they studied eclipses and they knew the moon swing and all these big things. Isn't that wonderful? And suddenly we came along and said, well, they actually also knew about procession, which is this 25,800-year cycle which sees the pole change and the stars drift. And the curious thing about this, and I, I never cease to be amazed by this, is the fact that at the specific moment that Newgrange and Fornox were in use, although the archaeology doesn't officially state that Fornox is contemporary with Newgrange. It puts it in roughly the same time frame. Deneb was doing this. It was setting due north just momentarily. But that's the only time for about a, a century or a couple of centuries in the entire 26,000 years this is happening. And they happened to capture it using this alignment of structures. There's the Hooper swans in a field. Deneb was the pole star, I think, don't, don't quote me here, 16,000 BC. I think Andy Collins, yeah, dips into that in his work, The Cygnus Mystery, yeah. These are the whoopers. Now, unfortunately, in recent years, there's been a lot of activity in the Boyne Valley. There's been a lot of our, um, agricultural activity. Those swans are not coming to the same fields that they were coming to five and six years ago, unfortunately. So maybe, maybe an ancient tradition has been broken now. This is an overlay or, well, a, a, a comparison of the cruciform, central cruciform part of Newgrange and the cruciform, the overtly cruciform shape of Cygnus, the swan, you see, I would be inclined to, to fit. Um, this is moon, the moon rise. The reason I bring this into the equation is because obviously, new grades, uh, any astronomer knows this, and so you might apply it to your, your own sites. Anybody that's studying alignments here would be very interested in the fact that any site that accepts the sun will also at some time accept the moon. Basically, it's that simple. At times in the moon cycle, it will share the exact declination that will put it into the rising winter solstice position. And that's exactly what this is, a picture of the moon rise in the solstice position. So in other words, astronomers using Newgrange may not just have used it to watch the sun. They could well have watched it at certain times in the moon cycle to watch the moon coming. What would that tell them? I'll tell you what would tell them. If the full moon is shining into Newgrange and the, and the beam is exactly the same as the sunbeam, what that's telling them is the moon is on a node. And it's on a node and it's in danger of being eclipsed because it's opposite the sun. Pressing the wrong button still. This is the entrance stone, the famous entrance curb stone at Newgrange. There are all sorts of theories as to what these symbols mean. Uh, we have been very lucky in meeting a man from uh, an American doctor called uh, John Gordon who has come up with very convincing theories about what these are about. He hasn't published them yet, but we have mentioned it in our book. And there are three very heavily decorated stones at Newgrange. This is one of them, and there's one exactly opposite this, and then there's another one called Curb 67. 
And he reckons that the interval of stones between these, they're all eclipse numbers, every one of them. If you try to work, around, work your way around the stones of Newgrange, counting the stones, every time you come to a decorated stone, no matter how, how, which way you go and how you try to calculate, you come up with an eclipse number. In other words, a number of lunar months that, that represents uh, an eclipse sequence. The great white uh, facade of Newgrange, uh, which has been reconstructed, and you can see that it sits against an 18-foot concrete wall. But nevertheless, it was always, and many of the cairns in Ireland were covered with quartz. Some of it was carted off over the years. There's still white quartz visible at Douth and at Nouth as well. And all of the cairns up at Loch Crew were known. The Loch Crew hills are known as Cairnban East and Cairnban West. Cairnban meaning the white cairn, Cairnbawn. We think that the reason the, the white quartz wall is there is because it represents the Milky Way, which is this giant, bright, milky ring in the sky. And in fact, there are different names for uh, quartz. There are six or seven different names for quartz in Ireland. Some of them are like uh, sunstone, moonstone, shadow stone, that sort of thing. So you see a kind of cosmological uh, theme running through the whole lot. What it excites me even great, more fantastically about this is that at the time Newgrange is built, there are certain times of the year, at certain times of the night, when the whole Milky Way is visible on the horizon as one entire ring. So in other words, if you stood on the top of Newgrange and you look north, you, you, if you do a 360 degree turn, the Milky Way wraps itself around the whole horizon, which is something at the latitude of Newgrange that doesn't happen today. And even more excitingly, the moment that it's wrapped on the horizon is the moment when Denim is shining into Fornox. Now that could be an extraordinary coincidence. This is Venus, which as I said we were looking at yesterday evening. And Venus goes through a certain cycle. Uh, Uriel's machine authors, uh, Christopher Knight and Robert Lomas, suggested, postulated that Venus would have been visible inside Newgrange. And of course, they were absolutely right, spot on. Because, of course, Venus is another planet that follows the ecliptic. And something that follows the ecliptic is bound to share the declination of winter solstice sun and therefore be visible inside Newgrange at certain times. Now, the, um, in myth, Venus can be the calf. The cow and the calf is the moon and Venus. And it also the hag and the little hag. You see, when we were talking about the hag yesterday at Callanish, I got really excited about the fact that the moon was coming out of our belly because Newgrange is known as Bru Nabonia, which has always been translated as the mansion of the Boyne. Now, but Boan, Boinia, she was a female deity who we think is intrinsically connected with the moon and the Milky Way and some of the constellations. Uh, she's basically a sky goddess who connects with the land in a, in a very interesting way. But also, brew, mansion, I don't know, I mean, fair enough, maybe it does mean mansion, but it also means womb. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with um, Gambutas, but she, oh, I only discovered this after the book was published, she spoke about tombs being wombs. In other words, the whole idea that Newgrange represents, you know, the mother belly, the womb, and that the sun and the shaft of light is the male and the union of the two brings about birth. And we see that in the myths about Newgrange. Because, for instance, the great warrior hero, Cuchulain, he was, uh, shall we say, brought about by a supernatural union which happened inside Newgrange between Lou, this light sky god connected with the sun and the stars, and uh, Dechtina, his mother, who was actually in Newgrange at the time. And this is now it's the third of the, well, not the third, they don't go in any particular order, but this is the other of the three, uh, extensively uh, excavated and reconstructed over four decades since the 1960s. Uh, a fascinating site, multifaceted, huge, enormous, uh, breathtaking. Uh, there are 10 or 12 periods of activity right from the early Stone Age until the present day. It's got 17 satellite tombs. It's got the biggest collection of megalithic art in Europe, it's got 25% of all known megalithic art in Western Europe in one location. It's got two passages that face, roughly speaking, east and west. This is the entrance to the Western Passage with this kind of phallic standing stone outside. Both passages have phallic. Well, they're not phallic as such. They're, they're like square blocks of uh, polished sandstone outside either entrance. Now it's excited people for a long time, and it excited Martin Brennan, but Martin had a problem because Martin wasn't allowed onto the site for various reasons. I'm not going to get into here. Oh, there was a bit of to and fro, and there was a few crosswords exchanged with the archaeologist, and he basically wasn't allowed in. So Brennan did all his drawings of now outside the perimeter fence using binoculars <laughs> in the evenings. He'd sit there for like two hours. No, it's serious. I mean, that's a true story. Uh, so 
Brennan postulated that Nauth was an equinox site uh, because the drawings, uh, the plans of Nauth appear to have these passages that face neatly east and neatly west. But it turns out that years later we discovered, no, it was actually a mapping error that was magnetic. And in fact, they don't point neatly east and west, so they're not exactly equinoxial. Brennan called this uh, a sundial. Sorry. And he said that you place your gnome on here and you watch the shadow. And to me, I mean, that fits, that looks nice as far as I'm concerned. I don't know much about sundials now, but uh, in terms of tracing out time and marking time, sundials are a good thing. Here's another one on the top of another stone at mouth. This is fantastic. This is five and a half thousand year old astronomy. This is what Brennan calls the calendar stone. And uh, if, you, if you look at, basically, uh, just to give you a very quick idea of what's contained on here. These are crescents and these are circles. And there are 22 crescents and, nine, and seven circles. 22 plus 7 equals 29 equals lunar synodic period. And there are three crescents which are covered by this spiral symbol. And any astronomer knows there are three days when the moon disappears behind the sun and it's invisible. That's what we call, in astronomy, we call that the new moon today. New moon in astronomy today means invisible moon. New moon, traditionally speaking, for other people means the first crescent that appears in the, in the light of day afterwards. If you count this, apparently it comes to a subunit of the metonic cycle. So Brennan reckons that this was a complicated lunar calendar. Interestingly enough, something I discovered about this last summer when I was sitting with my back to it, was that if you look out, between two mounds in the distance is the Hill of Tara. So I don't know whether that's significant. This is the only picture ever taken inside the Western Passage of sunset at the time of the equinox. I don't know why it hasn't been photographed. This passage is open. It's been investigated for the last 40 years. All of the people who've worked on the site know that there's some alignment there that it's going on. But what this picture actually proves, if you look at what the sunbeam is doing, it's actually striking the left wall and not really illuminating the right wall, which suggests that the sunset is further north than the passage points to. And in fact, when the site was surveyed six, seven years ago in 2000, it was found that, yes, indeed, it's not due west. It's 11 degrees south of due west. So... This was kind of trumpeted as being, you know, proof that Nauth is not an equinoxially aligned structure, therefore it's not astronomically aligned at all. Wrong. Step in, American, another American doctor by the name of Charles Scribner, who had been studying astronomy with the naked eye for 25 years. In other words, he looked at what he was seeing in the sky and he recorded it, never used a telescope. And he was able to say, lads, do you know what's going on here? What's going on here is what you have to do with Nauth is you have, with both passages, by the way, the eastern passage is five degrees off east. It's 85 degrees. What you have to do with Nauth is you have to, when the sun is setting and penetrating into the maximum depth of the passages, you have to watch what the moon is doing. <laughs> very neat. And I'll tell you exactly how it works. It's very simple. When the sun is shining into the back of, or the, at least the bend in the passage at Nauth West, if, for instance, there's a first crescent moon in the sky that day, then there's going to be a first crescent moon at the next equinox. On the eastern side, if you watch what the sun is doing, if you watch the sun coming in, watch what phase the moon is that day. If, for instance, it's a full moon, then there's going to be a full moon on summer solstice, there's going to be a full moon on autumn equinox, and there's going to be a full moon at, summer sol at winter solstice. What it was actually doing was, because there's a difference in the length of the seasons then as per now, and the difference then meant that if you watched the, what the moon was doing on a certain day, it would repeat itself for the various festivals. So in other words, you knew exactly what phase of the moon there was going to be three synodic months later, three synodic months later, three synodic months later. So all you had to do was go to now at, at Easter time, around the time of the equinox, uh, shortly afterwards, actually. It's equinox plus six days, which is fascinating because of St. Patrick, because Patrick lit his fire on the Hill of Slain on March the 26th, equinox plus six days. So equinox plus six days, you sit yourself in the back of Nauth, you watch the sun coming in, that's brilliant. Then you go outside and you look at the moon, you go, first quarter, great, okay. Three first quarters time is going to be summer solstice. Nine first quarters time is going to be winter solstice. And that's your basic simple calendar. There's a, an eclipse of the moon coming up over Drogheda recently. That was only last, that's uh, uh, six or eight months ago. Uh, the cosmic grid. This is slain. This is what I was telling you about earlier. You come up slain, you see all these Christian monuments, and you don't realize that if you continue your way through these, into the distance, this, these trees are growing on the top of this moat, the moat of King Slonia. Slain, curiously enough, finds itself at the center of a series of alignments. Uh, what, I don't know. We call them ley lines here. Or I think we call them ley lines too, but just not so much. I think we're a little bit behind the times. You guys are ahead of us on this kind of research because, you know, all sorts of things crop up on ley lines, don't they? 
holy wells, crossroads, sacred trees, meeting places, all that sort of stuff, which is not, to be honest with you, what we would have been looking for. But Slane finds itself at the centre of an, equ an equinoctial alignment on one side from Millmount, as we said, on the other side from Cairn T at Loch Crew, which is a very famous equinox site. Again, a discovery of Martin Brennan. And this is the backstone on Cairn T, which is illuminated on the equinoxes. And the sunlight illuminates these sunwheel patterns uh, as it rises on the morning of the equinoxes, March and September, vernal and autumnal. And that's a, a view kind of looking at the passage on a misty, foggy day when the fog was coming in and we'd nothing better to do than shine a few torches. And I think this is very interesting because if you're in Cairn Tee and you're looking out at the spring equinox sunrise, it's rising over the hill of Slane, which is where St. Patrick was said to have lit his paschal fire. And of course, the tradition of lighting fires at certain times of the year, is it still a big practice in this country? It's dying in Ireland. But the, the, the major festival of course, is Halloween in Ireland, and that continues the, the Samhain uh, festival. In certain parts of rural Ireland, fires are still lit on St. John's Eve. Uh, that's still a tradition that carries on today, but it is a dying tradition, unfortunately. But this goes all the way back to probably the Stone Age times. And the symbolism in all this is beautiful, because Patrick brought the cross, you know, the symbol of Christianity. But he didn't really bring the cross, because the cross would be here already. We saw that at Newgrange, because Angus, who took the form of a swan, Angus and Kerr, I forgot to tell you about the legend, Angus, the owner of the brew, fell in love with this maiden and they took the form of swans and flew into Brunabonia. But he had this shape of the cross long before any of this stuff came along. This is the most famous example of a high cross in Ireland. It's not that far from Newgrange. It's only about 10 miles from Newgrange at a place called Monaster Boyce outside Drogheda. And the thing I love about these crosses is they all have the, seem to have the sun in the centre of them. And I mean, that's, that's basically like a different representation of Newgrange if you think of the cross shape with the sun in its centre. And this is uh, just a quick overview of the cosmic grid, showing you some of those alignments. This is the Slane alignment that heads to Loch Crew, Millmount and Rathmave Tara, all the way to Carberry as well in the distance. This is an interesting one here. If you follow Newgrange to Fornox, but if you follow it backwards, it hits Dulic, which is said to be the oldest church in Ireland, the first stone church, and through this very interesting signet-shaped crossroads, and all the way back to a, a Barrow Cemetery at Schlieve Brow, which is a very uh, extensive site. And that's on another alignment. So as you can see, there's a fair bit of that going on in in Ireland, what you'd call the ley lines. Just very briefly to tell you that some of the myths that we've discovered can be deciphered astronomically. One very famous story is the story of how Cuchulain got his name Cuchulain, because when he was a kid he was called Sitanta. And what Sitanta did was he was going to the feast in Ulster being held by the King Cunnahor. And uh, Cunnahor had the doors closed and he had the security guards put on and the dogs released because he thought everybody was there but Satanta hadn't arrived. What happened was Satanta came running over the hill and the hound suddenly saw him and came running at him, this giant hound. And the story says that the hound could literally have swallowed him in one gulp. But Cuchulain was very adept with Hurley. I don't know if you've ever seen the Irish game Hurley. It's a bit like hockey except for it's an aerial version. But Cuchulain was very gifted at this trick where he threw the Schlitter in the air and then he threw the Hurley in the air to hit the Schlitter and was able to catch the two. So what he did was the story says, anyway, that um, Satanta hit the Schlitter into the hound with such ferocity that it went right through him and tore his entrails out his rear end. In the Irish Zodiac, there's no Leo. There's a hound. And what actually happens is, is that when the moon is on a node above Orion, in Orion's hand, Orion appears to toss the moon into the hound out through his entrails. And that's how we deciphered that story. Interestingly about the tawn and mythology in Ireland that refers to bulls, and we heard somebody yesterday... Was it Charlie Sturton? Did somebody mention white and black bulls yesterday representing? Yeah, I was very interested in that. You see, for me, the bull sets the time frame in which all of this stuff is supposed to have happened, and that is the age of Taurus, which is the Neolithic, at the time the spring equinox sun was housed in the constellation of Taurus, and of course the very famous Pleiades. I forgot to tell you the story of Bressel, the one about Douth. The legend says that at the time the mound was built, there was a famine, a cattle famine in Ireland. And all that was left in Ireland was one bull and seven cows. One Taurus and seven sisters. I don't know. That's our interpretation of the myth. That's the time frame. And finally, we're on to the giant landscape effigy, one thing that we share with Glastonbury. And we're very excited about this and exploring the links between the two places uh, this is, if you um, try to imagine Orion in this kind of uh, posture, you know, he's got this, he's either got a shield or a sword in his hand. And the critical thing is that he's got the sun and the moon and the planets passing above his head in the Milky Way. So there are two crossing points. 
there are two crossing points in the sky, sorry, before I go on, where the sun and the moon and the star and the planets pass the Milky Way, and that's one of them. It's above Orion. He appears to be grabbing it. This is the effigy that we've discovered. It's in an area which is known as Fair Ard, which translates as Far Ard, the High Man. We're very interested in this. We have found a whole plethora of stuff which suggests that this road figure is, in fact, some sort of a ground representation of Orion. The critical difference being that he doesn't appear to have an upraised arm. He has his arm down by his side. But nevertheless, there's a village up here called Loud, and Loud was the center of an ancient sun-worshipping cult, and this marks where the sun passes above the figure. Just to give you some idea as to the evidence for this and why we think that this might be more than just an accident, Amrigan is buried here at Drogheda, and Amrigan was known as Bright Knee, Amrigan Bright Knee, and that marks the point of Orion. I don't know whether that's on the next slide. Yeah, Rigel Brightney. Okay, hazel nuts, the nuts that hang over the well of of uh, Necton, uh, may well be the belt, and Cullen is the place of the hazel. Dunlear means the hollow of the shield of the sturdy one or the sturdy man. There's a place here called Skiamore, which has been translated as the large hawthorn, hawthorn tree, tree, but which we think comes from Skiamore, the big shield. Uh, slain marks the other, the back of the other leg. Uh, I'll talk to you about this site here because this is how I'm going to finish. There's a whole plethora of sites up here which seem to relate to the Milky Way. And as you know from looking at the pictures of Orion, the Milky Way runs past, and we were talking about Nuadu's silver arm there earlier on. Sorry, backwards. Backwards. Some of these are very exciting. There's one in particular called Balaboni, which is literally... Balak Bofina, the way of the white cow. And if you look in an old Irish dictionary for Milky Way, that's what you get, Balak Bofina. <laughs> so there's a place name there that literally means Milky Way. There's another one called Bohor Namo, the road of the cow, because the Milky Way is also known Bohor Namo Finna, the road of the white cow. And it's also known as the wood of the bab, the crow who landed on Cuchulain's shoulder when he was dying. So there's a whole sort of uh, load of place names. There's one called Fiolaria which is the wood of the hand of the king. So although we don't see his hand there, the idea is that his hand was raised in the silvery wood to grab the sun and the moon and the stars. There's a lot of uh, supporting information about this in the book. It's the biggest chapter. We finished the book with the chapter about the high man because although it's not ostensibly about necessarily Neolithic um, astronomy, we have this kind of idea that it's very ancient because of some of the things that are going on. There's a site here just in front of his mouth, called Garrett's Fort. And Garrett's Fort has a cave myth attached to it. And the myth says that under the ground, in a ring fort, in a passageway, there is a mythical enchanted sleeping army. And they are waiting until the end of time, when a mythical six-fingered, red-haired warrior will come into the cave, will draw a sword from a stone, don't mention Arthur, <laughs> and he will rouse the sleeping army, and he will bring Ireland to glory, and will defeat the enemy at the end of time. The reason we're curious about all this, and this is going to be another book, so I better not go into it too much detail today, is the fact that we definitely think there's something interesting in the fact that we've discovered the high man at a time when, on the summer solstice, the sun is actually directly in the hand of Orion. So in other words, in, uh, on June 21st this year, when you're watching the sun going down from whatever site you happen to be at, the sun is in the hand of Orion. And remember, because of procession, that it, it's going to last a century but the next time that happens is going to be in nearly 26,000 years' time. I think that's very curious because it's also the vertex. I mean, it's the top of the ecliptic. You know, it's, the, it's basically as high as the sun can go. It's above Orion at the moment. Oh, yeah, there's another little site there. See the edge of the barrow, uh, marrow bath? We're nearly finished now. There's another, there's another site here which represents the shoulder of Orion, called Smar Moor. And Smar Moor was a place where Cuchulain was supposed to have prepared a magical bath of marrow, you know, bone marrow, to heal a warrior called Cairn who had been wounded in a battle. But the place name specifically means the edge of the trough of marrow. And we see in the Dinshenicus that the Boyne, and we don't know whether the Dinshenicus is talking specifically about the Boyne River or the Milky Way, more likely a combination of both. We see the Boyne described as the white marrow of Phelimith. So we have this idea of silver, we have the idea of river, we have the idea of milk, and we also have the idea of, of marrow. These are some of the roads. 
I mean, I've read a little bit about the Glastonbury Zodiac, and one thing I was fascinated by was the fact that when we were in school in Ireland, we were told that the Romans built straight roads, and I was fascinated by this. You know, a lot of Roman roads in England are very straight for miles, you know? I was fascinated by that. Turns out, apparently, you guys think that the Romans only built on top of stuff that was there already, which I was fascinated by, because I think that's exactly what was going on here. These are some of the roads on the high man figure. Because in Ireland, roads go round hills and things that they don't, they don't tend to be very straight. They are in a few places. There's a few other counties where there's very interesting stuff going on. This is the site of a giant Cistercian Abbey called Mellifont Abbey, which marks Orion's Nebula, right? And it's called Mellifont, which means the well of honey, or the well of knowledge, as it were. Uh, now, it's ruined now, but in the, around 11, 1200, this was the biggest abbey in Ireland. It was massive. So Glastonbury has its abbey, and the high man has his abbey. This is near Garrett's Fort. This is called the Jumping Wall of Kildamock. And there's a very famous story that literally says it moved. And the amazing thing about this wall is it's the gable end of a church. The amazing thing is when you go there, not only does the course of the brickwork uh, lean downwards that way, but if you're against the wall, it leans out towards you such that you're kind of half afraid to stand there in case it falls on you. And then the original foundation is here, and the wall is three feet this way. The wall appears to have jumped in the middle of the night. And that's very close to Garrett's Fort. And this is a sunset that I took just before the book was published, just to nicely illustrate the idea of the setting sun. Let me tell you just one thing before I wrap up about the setting sun. In Ireland, the idea of heaven is embodied with such places as Tirnanog, the land of eternal youth and happiness. Mag Mel, the plane of happiness, and Melifont personifies that idea. And um, Tirnamio, the land of the ever living ones. And Tirnamio, I think, corresponds with the Milky Way. And there's another place name on the high man, you can read it in the book, that it literally means the ridge of the, 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 uh, ridge of the ever living ones, Tirnamio, or ridge, the ridge of the, of the ever living ones. So the entrance to the other world was said to have been opened when the sun was touching the ground. I love that idea, because I think that the, in the Irish vision of things, in the Neolithic vision of things, the other world was in the stars, and the entrance to the stars opened at critical times. We see that with Newgrange. You know, when the sun is touching the ground, it's like a bridge opens up. The sun sets, and the stars appear, and there you have your Tiernanog, the, the, uh, the wonderful afterworld coming out. If you want to read more, and you don't want to buy the book, shame on you, uh, Mythical Ireland is our website, www.mythicalireland.com. And there's plenty there to keep you reading for a few weeks. And that's it. Thanks a million. This has been a Megalithomania audio production. For more information, visit megalithomania.co.uk.